right. Uh, welcome to the Aramir Roundtable. Today's the 23rd of February, 2022. Uh, special guest, uh, Bruno. Bruno and I go back a long time. I think we've met probably in the early 2000s. So it's been pushing 20 years that we've known each other. And uh, Bruno used to run the Rhino Trailer Service for us, and now he's running it for a, a private capital. And uh, Bruno is kind enough to uh, come back to the round table and give us an update on how the Rhino is doing. So um, it's nice to have you back. Always a pleasure, Bruno. And uh, yeah, it's uh, curious how the Rhino is going for you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Um, um, yeah, I, I, some of the audience may know me. I mean, and as you correctly said, we've known each other for a long time. And I used to run the mentoring service on the Rhino. And um, then I, I, mean, I was hired as a quant trader for a family office. So it's like private capital or a closed fund. And uh, so my presentation today will be my type of rhino. And for those who may have um, watched earlier presentations since 2016, I'm probably, um, I've always said that the, the rhino may not be a generic broken and butterfly strategy, but still a very versatile, very flexible type of strategy. And so I have customized my Rhino as a conservative Rhino, uh, and I will try and um, go through what I've been doing and what is my thinking behind it. So if it works okay, my introduction, because we're, we're working in a very high vol environment, and something that I've said in, in previous presentations that many traders are not fully aware of is that we are Vega traders. We trade, we, we, we manage our delta, but basically the crux of the matter of the strategy is to sell volatility and of course capture theta all the time. So I always remind that we have to take care of our very big exposure. Okay, so let's start. Um, as a preamble, um, and again, for those who have known me for some time, I'm not a big fan of backtesting or automated strategies on options. I don't think they work. There are a few, I, I know I'm on some occasions I'm wrong. I know there are some set and forget or forget or no touch strategies, but most of the times, it's better not to stick to rules, but and that's why my conservative Rhino has evolved into a stripped down version of the original one. And the, the, the key guideline is to try and keep a flattish delta over the largest possible range, and even more so when volatility goes haywire, like at the, at the moment. The, because it's important to have a routine, I always shake my trade in a typical Rhino style. Um, and we will see that there's a little caveat that because I want my delta to be flat to negative, I, it's not exactly the same type of entry as before. We will see that my entries are generally more OTM. I know that we forfeit theta by doing so, but that's the way it is. Another thing also is that, and also a reason why I, I don't really believe in backtesting, because we have to analyze the volatility, we have to analyze the VIX, uh, even sometimes short-term VIX, the VIX 9D. And so we, we, we I mean, people backtest, they, they want to have a simple rule to, to follow and to stick to. Um, and they don't really take into account that, for example, now we are in backwardation. Or so what do you do when you're in backwardation? Are you sticking to the same strategy? I mean, head down with uh, preset adjustments? I don't think so. So we have to adapt. And adapting, also means that we, I mean, I know it's a bit of a dilemma for me to say that the, the Rhino is a simple strategy at the same time. I also say that you have to know your Greeks, you have to um, uh, know what's going on under the hood because, uh, uh, and so maybe it's, the way I trade it is maybe not the beginner's type of Rhino. It's more intermediate to advanced, but anyway, I will go through my line of thinking and hopefully, it will be easy to understand. So my current trading environment is okay because now I'm a professional trader. I have a professional routine and my routines, my routine involves, for example, and I'm gonna show you trading view, 
analyzing the market and the markets. So I check um, SPX, of course, uh, and because of the high correlation, I also check what's going on on the NASDAQ. There's a very strong correlation at the moment on between NDX, SPX, and even the Dow Jones. So I check which one is leading the market. But I mean, really, for those who are trying to diversify, which is not exactly not my problem, really, but it is something that we have to look at. And I, I take it as a positive that um, if you follow the, the tech titans, the, the fangs, I don't know whether I can see them here. This, this Zoom is taking a little bit of my space anyway. Um, so I check the fangs, I, I check also the DJY. I also check uh, how VIX is behaving at the moment is picking up quite nicely. So there's a good resistance here. So I don't think we will have a major sell off today. So I check fangs, I mean, because of the, the tech titans really lead the market wherever. Um, and because now the moment, because the market is a little bit shaky, I also look at what investors are doing in terms of divesting from techs and moving towards value. So I check the VUG of a VTV. And as you can see, we have a, a move towards value stocks, defensive stocks. So all I'm saying is that as a professional routine, you have to look beyond um, your SPX and uh, you have to really analyze what's going on. Um, I also check uh, the interest rate situation, the credit market, the two year, 10 year uh, treasury spread, which is at the moment is not looking great. Of course, we have GDP tomorrow. So I also look at economic indi indicators, but okay, I'll just, I want, I mean, this is not a presentation about uh, market reading, but this is an important thing. <clears throat> Another uh, essential part right now is that we work in a very high volume environment. And so it has affected the way I trade the right now. Um, we, I, will, I will show you the current positions. And, um, and, and of course, you, I mean, it's, to me, it's common sense, but I mean, um, if there are questions, I can understand. But for example, um, I will blend my broken butterflies with balanced flies to have a little bit more negative delta, things like that. Another thing is that I use uh, what I call professional benchmarks. I use a, a target in terms of a margin to equity. I use a target in terms of value at risk. It may look a little bit of an overkill for a, a individual trader, but there are good, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good routine. I mean, it's a good way to prevent catastrophes. When, I mean, if you, if you manage your margin, if you manage your max loss for the day, or I mean, this is something that I believe is, is important. So on, on this, in this presentation, I will show you my conservative rhino. But as a quick aside, because I understand that some people will say, oh, whoa, you're going too far away from the rhino. So for those who have seen previous presentations, the, the question I, I would have expected and I would expect at the end of this presentation is that uh, would a standard rhino with the standard guidelines, standard rules work okay? Yes and no. I mean, the market has been bullish high vol for quite a while. And high vol means that you pay less for your broken butterflies. And, and being bullish means that you just have to handle the upside. And overall, if you don't mind starting your, your position with a positive delta, like for example, um, a few years ago, the RTT was um, compared to, I mean, uh, unlike the RTT, the Rhino is supposed to start with a flattish to negative delta. The RTT was not too bothered about that. So if you have an RTT mind, so to say, um, yeah, maybe you can start. But um, this is not my trading style, and it's not conservative enough anyway. So um, and it, as we are seeing now in the last month or so, or at least the, the, next, the last few weeks, um, an RTT can be uh, quite treacherous when the market starts correcting uh, deeply, uh, and that's why that's where I think being co more conservative. Maybe I would make less money by always being delta flat or delta negative when the market grinds up. 
but I think it is safer. So this is a very safe approach. But for those who are more bullish than I am, or, can, or, can, or people who can stand more drawdowns when market dips pretty deep, yeah, why not? Um, it's really like a, a buy the dip approach. I mean, vol pop, enter, another vol pop, um, in, in, increase into your position. That's okay. I mean, it's just not my style. And as I said at the very beginning, the Rhino is very versatile, very flexible. And for those who are in this type, in that type of mind, there's no problem at all. Um, in terms of um, what I also look at, as I said before, I look at VIX90, the short-term volatility. I could look, also look at VVIX, volatility of volatility. And also in the last few weeks, we had a, a, a different regime where, I mean, um, seasoned traders know that generally we sell more, more volatility than realized volatility over time. But lately we had strong realized volatility that was not really compensated for adequately, I would say, with IV. So IV was, even though VIX was high, VIX was probably not high enough. The level of hedging was probably not high enough for the risk in the fluctuations of the market. So that's something I always look at. I mean, are we being paid properly for what we do? So I had already my quicker side on market reading. Uh, here we see um, uh, calculations that I also make every day. These are the correct calculations from yesterday. Um, SPX VIX correlation is very strong, 93%, maybe 92 today. I mean, it's still pretty strong, and, we, and that is good. Um, when SPX VIX, the correlation goes positive, something is brewing in the background, and um, you can check on the chart uh, the SPX VIX correlation versus SPX, and you will see that generally something is, is going to happen, a correction or not. On this particular sell-off or correction, we didn't have a change in the correlation, but that happened. So it doesn't mean that you have to wait for correlation to deteriorate, deteriorate to get that signal, but when you have it, be careful. Um, as I said, also, we have a very strong um, SPX NDX correlation. And if you do an SPX FANG, I mean, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and I also add um, a Tesla and Microsoft to the mix. It's pretty strong. And we also have a, a very strong SPX the Dow Jones correlation. And when you look at, um, at the performance day to day, I mean, the, the, the daily moves, generally SPX is halfway between what's going on in Dow Jones and, and the NASDAQ. So in a way, it's pretty easy at the moment. You just have to check what's going on with the tech titans. The, the big five of the of the market and you, sh you should be able to if you have any competency skills in reading the market for those big big ones you should know where the market is going so again that's something that uh, i really recommend advice to do is to check those correlations and check what is moving the market we will see that there's something else to look at in a moment so Adapting to high volatility. This is just a reminder of something I said in a previous presentation for that East Coast group, the Rally Durham or something, um, is that in high volatility, it's, I mean, it's not a, 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 a fail safe thing, but it makes sense to increase wing sizes. Um, by increasing wing sizes, you have a a PCS, or it's not PDE, PDS ratio um, that decreases a little. In other words, you have a, a, a stronger, firmer PDS. And so the larger wing sizes will make your, your, your resilience on the downside a lot better. Um, I, still, I still use a 25 difference between um, P PCS and PDS. And the reason is that it makes my margin calculation, both on Reg T or portfolio margin easier, because uh, it is the same. It uses, it uses the same capital, whether it's a 100 slash 75 or a 125 slash 100, it's exactly the same. Conversely, and something that I wish I had done at the time when Vol 
was rock bottom in 2017, is that one should actually decrease wing sizes. I mean, this is something I've learned over time. And uh, if we ever go back to a local environment, I will also, I mean, uh, now, I mean, I've, I've learned my lesson. Um, something, because my prevailing principle, my ruling principle is really to keep the delta flat to slight, slightly negative. You have to move your broken butterflies further OTM because as high velocity pressurized, pressurizes the, the, the T plus zero, um, I mean, it's easy to see that you would start with positive delta, which I don't like. So I move my broken butterflies OTM and sometimes 100 to 200 points below to get what I want. You'll pay a cheaper price as well because the, the price of, of a broken butterfly is not only the volatility, is also you pay for being closer to the tent. So it's cheaper and the downside, because there's always a flip side to anything with options, is that you will have a lower setup, but that's, a, that's okay. And at the moment when volatility, volatility is really high, like above 28, 30, um, just I mean, if, unless I would really increase my wing sizes to something huge or move my, my brain butterflies very far OTM to the, to the extent that there will be very little theta, I, I do now more, more and more often, I combine my broken butterflies with balanced flights. And that's to me the best way to have a good balance in between theta and negative delta. As I, as I said, I mean, all those things are pretty moderate variations. It's just a simple way by mixing larger wing size ring butterflies and balanced butterflies. It's just a way to balance risk. And overall, it's, it's fine. I, some people would start with uh, calendars or that's more complicated. I, I still believe what I do is simple. So we're going to look at a typical uh, cycle. Um, so um, in this case, in the next slides, I will show you a, I think it was a February cycle. Again, bullish high vol, entry still around 770 TE, ATM versus A. Uh, OTM versus ATM, as I mentioned. Um, and also, the, the, you can choose your level according to support resistance levels. So good support at the moment is around 4150. So maybe if I, when I enter May pretty soon, I will check whether my shorts are below 4150. I mean, this, which is now, I think we are below 4300. So maybe 150 to 200 points. Uh, under, under the money. I mean, that's something I, I, will, I will look at. Um, pricing, um, I don't really look at optimal entry prices. I mean, but we know that pricing is, is two dimensional. The best market environment is market at ball up, which is a rare, uh, I mean, it occurs maybe 15, 20% of the time or even less. Um, so I, I'm not really trying, I, I no longer try and get the best price. When I enter, the price is good enough, I just go for it. Um, but it is true that you either buy on a Volpop. Uh, Volpop is uh, less important when you go OTM. It's more important when you, st when you stick to ATM or near ATM entries. That I mean, we can go into um, details about this or I'd, I'd be happy to answer questions, but this, this is not really important, but just remind, just we just have to keep in mind that yes, we sell volatility, so we have to check uh, the vol volatility behavior and price behavior, two dimensional. So what I've learned over the last few years is that, and I know that this can confuse beginners, is that I've learned to relax or even ignore Delta rules. So that's something that really, um, I had to give up on from the original or, original uh, Rhino. And even when the market behaves, I would say normally, not like now with the market going crazy, is that because you start OTM and the original Rhino, you had a, 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 a scale in alert when the, the market goes up by 1%, 1%, I mean, 
it's, it's nothing these days. I mean, um, and because you start OTM, the market is already above that limit. So I don't use regular scaling rules and I don't use delta rules. For also for that reason is that if when the market runs away, the market will just shoot up or grind up and you will never build a sufficient negative delta to, to, to scale in or adjust. So it's more common sense um, to start adjusting. Um, and over time, I mean, I've been working for this firm for now two years. I've actually learned to use margin management and also capital reallocation. So how I move capital from one cycle to the next. These are my major rules. Okay, let's look, I mean, let's go back to something simple. A typical entry in a high wall um, that was, I can't read, it's too small. And I think it was a February entry in December. I used a larger wing size, as I just said. And my rule, but that's a, absolutely a thumb sack type of rule, is that when the VIX is above the third quartile, which is probably 1975 to 20 these days, I, 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 I use larger wing sizes. When volatility eventually goes back to normal, which is below that, that um, 1975, 20 or whatever, um, I will return to normal sizes. And if one day volatility goes back to low volts so in, in the first quarter, first quarter, I will probably start switching to uh, lower wing sizes. So by doing this, I, 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 yeah, I managed to get a slightly negative delta. In this instance, because as I said, I always check where the market is going. This is where I entered. So there was a good vol pop. And so, yeah, this is a February cycle. Well, SPX VIX was very well anticorrelated. So this is a good environment to start a trade. It was 770G. So, I mean, really no sweat. I mean, this one is, was very routine. Two weeks later, I think the market was starting to grind up. Volatility went down. Again, market up, vol down. When, when the correlation is good, that's quite normal. So the market was just picking up a little bit of profit. Uh, I always, always check the, the, the sweet spot because when you start OTM, I mean, you don't want to get into um, negative theta and uh, well, so the sweet spot is often a, a key level to do something about your trade. And I check whether theta remains positive. I'd, I'd like to have at least 10 theta on my entry, um, depending on the number of butterfly, butterflies I enter because as I said before, um, when I allocate capital from one cycle to the next, sometimes I don't have enough capital to enter the regular entry size, which is three broken butterflies. Sometimes I enter two because I am a little bit short of capital or because I feel that I need to have skin in the game, but I'm not too comfortable with, with, with going with the rule. So sometimes I enter one, sometimes I enter two. Sometimes, as I said, sometimes I enter broken butterfly plus balance fly. But I'd like to have at least 10, 10 theta. And besides my margin, margin management or capital management um, on this on this type of um, uh, entry, or I would say the the takeoff phase in the in the two the first two to three weeks, I check whether my theta is still okay. So end of the sweet spot, theta, okay. Now, on, in this case, the market was um, grinding up, still bullish, high vol. And this is a, a new type of adjustment. And I've seen this type, of, well, it's not, it's not a new type of adjustment. It's a, it's a common sense, not rule-based adjustment. Just to extend the tent on the upside, I will add something which I call I mean, it's not something that I didn't come up with that name. I mean, a, a colleague of mine called it a speed speed bump call calendar. And um, so you, the good thing also is that you you have a, a more balanced Vega. And because volatility holds up all the way, you're not too concerned. I mean, your call calendar, if the market keeps grinding up, 
it will be doing okay. So in this case, I flatten my delta, although it's not so much uh, important, it's more really like lifting the, the t plus zero, t plus n. Generally, I look at t plus seven, sometimes t plus 14. Um, the way I place my call calendars is roughly around 30 delta. Um, it doesn't have to be a strict rule there again. If you have a strong resistance from one of the charts I showed you with my Murray Math lines, um, I'm going to go back quickly to trading view. At the same time, we'll see where the market is going. Probably not going well. 4218, yeah. Um, so if, 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 for example, here, I would say that 4525 is a strong resistance, I doubt it will be 30 delta, but um, that's something I will always keep at the back of my mind when um, placing my whole calendar. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Um, you must accept that if the market then retraces, your call calendar will lose value, you may lose money, it's still a hedge. So it's okay to lose a bit of money on your hedge. I mean, you buy peace of mind with a hedge. Sorry, this is, that speed bump is a bullish market type of peace of mind because you increase, you increase your overall theta and you have a, a flatter T plus zero over a large range. So this is something that makes sense. And as you can see, if we look now on 14 DT, the trade has reached what is to me a, a very adequate profit target of 2%. I think it's about $900, it could be a little bit more. So on $38,000 plan capital, it's probably 2 and 2.3, 2.4, that's fine. And as you can see in this part of the example, it was very simple. Not much to do, just add that speed bump, wait a little longer, and then exit. So this is a textbook type of uh, um, strategy management. It does not, of course, always work that way. But let's say that we keep high vol and we return to a bullish mode that will probably work again. So the first takeaway is that conservative rhino works pretty well. As you have seen, we start with, uh, OTM. We just add that uh, upside speed bump and that's fine. Um, I came up with, again, it's being inspired by great traders. Um, I, I was a little bit hesitant about starting my call calendars on when I didn't need to flatten my delta. Um, but I, I, I got convinced and now I'm using them a bit more often. Doesn't mean that I, I use them very efficiently, but um, the, this type of um, strategy management works okay. Um, the alternative which I've used more often is um, using a CCS along with a broken butterfly or sometimes PCS rolls. PCS rolls are of, of course more or less capital neutral and almost like Vega neutral. So it depends in what, in what phase of the trade I am and whether I still want to add capital or not. If, I, if I'm at cruising altitude, I would probably go for PCS roll rather than adding broken butterflies because, or, because, or if the market is a little bit like edgy, um, I will be more hesitant to add capital to my trade. Okay, so the speed bump tab of upside adjustment it generally works well. Doesn't mean it will work all the time, but it works pretty well. <clears throat> so um, in this case, as I've said, it's, it's a no delta alert type of management. I know it can be confusing, but it's fine. Um, I generally use a narrow call calendar um, using the, the, on the short leg, the regular monthly expiration and, and on the long leg, the month end, that's fine. If you want a more of a Vega kick, particularly on the downside, it's better to go wider. One month wide is probably preferable. On the upside, it's not really important. Um, there are variations on call calendars. I mean, or, or not, not the Rhino as such, but similar strategy where you even start a call calendar right at the beginning. I, um, I've never, I, I mean, I'm not big on back, on back testing. So that's something, not something I've done 
Um, I'd rather wait a little bit whether the market goes up or any reason to enter a cold calendar. Um, but I understand, I mean, the people I know who enter a cold calendar right at the beginning, they do pretty well. So it can work as well. Um, a little warning is that in high vol, and that's why I was mentioning that it should be 30 delta or close to a strong resistance. In high vol, it's not advisable to let the market pass your calendar strike. Roll or add another one above, but it's your in low vol, your calendars will be more forgiving. You can let them glide through, let the market glide through. It's not really an urgency to, to close it or roll it or add another one. And you have to be more careful in high vol because your short leg will start weighing on the performance <coughs> of your calendars, but on, on both directions, actually, on both ways. Something I do, but and I know a lot of people don't, is that um, if you enter your calendars when you're in backwardation or you have a, um, a zero to positive horizontal skew, it's going to be beneficial. Basically, you sell, if you sell higher vol and you buy vol on, on the long leg, that's generally pretty good. And something that can help the the calendar fans is that I've done a gauge study on volatility. And in the last few years, I've noticed, and I'm not the only one, um, that there's less clustering as before. Gauge is that autoregressive thing, and which, in other words, tends to uh, indicate that high volatility calls for high volatility. So there's a cluster and high vol. And when the, when the volatility drops, the volatility stays low for a while. This does not occur anymore. It could be a consequence of quantitative easing, too much liquidity in the market. It's hard to say, but when volatility pops hard, generally after a few days, it goes down just the same way. So if you, if you sell a calendar um, um, when the market is in backwardation, it's, there's a likelihood that the, the high likelihood that the, the, the vol volatility will not be sustained at a high level, so your calendar will behave pretty well. So it's selling on a on the high horizontal skew, high positive or, or horizontal skew is pretty good. So when to adjust, I as I said before, more and more I use my capital management. And I use my margin, basically my margin management to determine when I need to, for example, reallocate capital. Um, it's very obvious when you use, when you're on a PM account, but even if you're on a rate T account, you can use the minus 12% rule, which is more or less how PM is calculated. So calculate your risk on minus 12% and you, you, you know what is exactly at risk right now. I am trading for a conservative fund or family office, and I use a maximum fit. I mean, my, my target on margin to equity is about 35%. And of course, this is, it, there can be fluctuations. So I allow myself up to 45%. If you are more a balanced uh, an individual trader, you can go a little higher. And I remember when I used to trade on my own account, I sometimes allow myself to be more aggressive, uh, 65 to 70% of capital being at play at any time. But these days I am a lot more conservative. Also because this QE, um, this high vol bullish to me does, I mean, high vol is good. We sell volatility, we, we, we trade um, um, almost at a bargain, but we know that there's a price to pay for that. Another thing also is that, um, Reallocating capital allows me, when the market gets after 20 ADT, 21 DT, I, I control my gamma. Controlling my gamma allows, of course, it's theta and gamma are related. So by controlling my gamma, I do forfeit some theta, but that's fine. It's a, it's a price to pay. So I, I'm not greedy. I don't go for 
maximum third day in the last two weeks to uh, to try and, and you know reach my profit target absolutely because I get good third day. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I always control my position government. I will show you my positions at the moment. I hope they're still holding okay in this bear market. Another thing, because I, as I said, in market trading, <clears throat> um, we have to look for information on the various sources. And something that came to my mind, thanks to a colleague of mine and other people who inspired me, I've started looking at uh, what dealers do. And SPX is a dealer's market. When you buy, it's a market maker that sells you something. When you sell, same way. It's not like when you trade uh, stock or futures or where um, basically the broker just connects you with a counterparty and that's it. Um, SPX is a dealer's market. And because of course, um, and that, that's probably something you've seen in other presentations. Um, market makers also need to balance their books. So for example, when there's a high demand for hedging, people buy a lot of puts, so they sell them puts. But by selling puts, they also have their own uh, risk. Um, if the market goes down, the, the selling puts can be quite, quite uh, uh, risky. So when the market goes, um, when demand for puts is high, like, like right now, and they sell puts to the buy side, uh, the retail traders or institutions, they have to sell futures to balance their books. And that's something that I calculate, it's called the GEX or GEX or gamma exposure. And uh, I'm using, or well, my own program is now a little bit more sophisticated, but there's a good one on a good starting point. It's a Python script and available on this website. And basically what does it say is that we have, I mean, I, th I think it was earlier today, I'm not sure it's still valid. You can update it several times a day if you want. Basically, zero gamma is where the dealers are quite happy doing nothing. At the moment, we are in negative gamma, so because the uh, the market is going down, they, they sh they're short. So in negative gamma, they short the market to um, cover the downside risk. But the, and you can see from the gamma exposure to what point they're looking at protection. So at the moment, I would say dealers are protecting a lot down to about 41 to 50. Um, we're not, not looking at the gamma flip and going long, but that's the same way. I mean, when the market goes up, they start buying futures and they also, so these two lines, we call them sometimes gamma walls, put gamma walls, call gamma walls. And these things are look now religiously every day. There's also a similar script because of course the dealers need to uh, cover the volatility exposure as well. Uh, so there's something called VEX or ban exposure. But this, 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 this would be a little bit of a digression, but that's also something dealers do. They do control their banner. So specificities of my pro trading. Um, I do trade using leverage, a little bit of leverage, 1.5 to 1.6. I could allow a higher planned capital. I could really load up my positions. I have chosen to control my risk with uh, standard Reg T um, guidelines. And on my PM account, according to my margin to equity, I allow myself to leverage, gear up a little bit. So for example, I know that by, by managing my PM margin currently, I can trade 1.5 to 1.6 um, times tranches. So, even if I only use 35% of uh, my capital at the moment, I can still have 50% more or 60% more tranches in the market. Something also I've learned to deal with is that slippage, bad fields, <coughs> excuse me, um, especially when you start entering large size orders, that's, that happens, that happens every day to me. Um, I realize also that the mark price is probably more important than the mid. The mark price for many brokers, and particularly IB, is a theoretical price, and that's what market makers follow. So the mid can be something, if, if you don't get to your mark, 
um, the market makers won't give it to you. So a lot of people follow the mid and start giving in. I mean, I follow the mark price really. That's what the market the market makers look at. Um, something also because you may have the best market reading technique and know your ways around. Uh, sometimes, and something I've done recently actually, is that I, we, when you don't know where the market is going, I just hedge my vega. So I'm not only delta neutral, but I will buy, for example, a put calendar just to mitigate my vega risk. So I still capture theta, but, and of course, if, as I just said, volatility pops up hard and then decreases, I mean, yes, I mean, you will also lose on the positive side when volatility uh, deflates rapidly. But sometimes it's just uh, more comfortable, better for the heart to just hedge your vega. So sometimes, um, and as I said, I'm not using a strict delta rules. Sometimes I will just do what it takes to um, have delta flat and almost vega flat. Okay, um, as I said before, I monitor my MT constantly. So now I'm gonna jump to the conclusion. There are many possible variations. I mean, uh, I, I agree with that. Um, on my Slack group, there are people who follow what I do. Others are more creative and they do their own thing. They have their own risk profile. And that's that's cool, absolutely cool. And this is the mandate I have. I'm basically, I've sh showed you now uh, what I do because that's my mandate. I mean, you, and as an individual trader, sometimes you don't have that uh, discipline and either you, uh, create it for yourself or it comes from your boss, but it's actually good to have one. So my margin of equity, my value at risk, all those things are very important to me. And at the uh, and also by re reallocating capital, every time you do an adjustment, by for example, peeling off, like now I'm peeling off March, I'm building April and I'm setting some capital aside for May that will be entered soon. This also is every time you move capital from one cycle to the next, it's the opportunity to control your delta and vega, but <clears throat> it's smoother. I mean, to me, it's it's a, it's easier to manage that way. So, I would recommend not to use strict delta alerts alerts because they don't work. I mean, um, last year or the year before, when the market was just plain bullish, um, the market could run away, and you 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 add you add. Uh, you, I mean, you. Add to your trade, and to what I mean, to, to what extent are you going to keep up with a rising market? I mean, sometimes it's, it's I mean, it doesn't make sense. If you look at the original gu uh, guidelines when the market was more tame, um, there was only one scale in. So I think it's you have to deal with the, with the, what we have at the moment. The good thing is that in a high vol, when the market goes up, you don't have a vol crush. Excuse me. So adding to your trade is, is not that complicated. Something I've not uh, mentioned on this slide, but that was in a, a previous presentation, is that when I start, when I said, well, I start with uh, larger wing sizes. Okay, high ball, I start with 125 slash 100, uh, OTM, and I could even go larger than that. As, the, as time goes by, I will generally go back to normal size or even go a narrow size. For example, if uh, I build a trade up after 49DT, most likely I will use a regular size, 100 slice 75 wing size. And in a very rare case where I still want to add, because maybe the market has run away, I still want to add a, a, a last broken butterfly, let's say around 35 or 30DT, not something I advise to do because generally uh, this is almost time to start scaling, start moving capital to the next cycle. So, but if you ever want to add another brain butterfly late in the life of the trade, I will go probably 75 slash 50 after 25 GT. There again, no strict rule. It's going to be your overall um, uh, T plus zero Delta Vega that will dictate the, the wing size. I mean, it, it's, as I said, it's just common sense. So we, now we are three quarters of an hour. And even for my own curiosity, I would like to see where the market is. 
and whether my trades are doing okay. 4284, so that's okay. So where are my trades? Okay. Okay, so this is uh, March. Okay, I'm positive. A little bit too much of a positive delta, but that's still manageable. Um, so this is, it, it can look like it's a very confusing position, but it's, it's fairly easy to manage, really. Like now, I'm going to start killing off. If the market goes down, I'm going to probably close one of the high broken butterflies if that will allow me to flatten my delta, it will reduce my capital usage. Generally, towards the end of the, of the cycle, after 21 or close to 14 GT, I want to be using less than 10K so that it does not impede capital allocation into new cycles. So this trade is doing okay. I've got good theta, so I'm not complaining. Um, and again, if anything, no strict rule here, but if I want to hedge my delta a little bit more, I can, of course, close this part, which is absolutely useless now. And I can close one broken butterfly here, and that's going to be just fine. Now, and of course, this one went through a hell of a roller coaster. And I'm happier with my April trade. I think it should be doing okay. Yeah, it's doing okay. Uh, now I'm, I have a little bit of positive delta, but that's fine. So on this one, I just went um, one, I mean, I entered probably two breaking butterflies, and then a third one. And little something I wanted for my own peace of mind is that when the market started started going down rapidly, I added a put calendar down below, I think around 3,900. So if I was to close my, my my put calendar here, I would have a lot more vague exposure. The trade generally has good resilience for the first two weeks, three weeks. So there's no need to really hedge your vega that early. <coughs> but now we're going on to seven, um, 77, so almost a month has gone by, and I'm starting to uh, mitigate my vega risk on the downside. Also, because, I mean, this. To me, this common sense. The market, this market is getting a little bit risky, so uh, I will hedge my delta and probably um, hedge my vega accordingly. So, I mean, overall, I mean, this trade is doing fine. I'm above my two percent target, so I could also just um, take the money and go on holiday. So that's what it is. You know, just be flexible. Um, flat delta of a large range. This is good enough for me. I've got a range on my T plus zero is from 4,100 to almost 4,500. So I can't complain, this is a large range. It's capturing good theta, nothing, nothing I can complain about. Okay, we have no, probably another 10 minutes left, so I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to answer questions. Hey, Bruno, um, I did have one. Uh, you mentioned your Slack group. Do you have a URL for people to join that? Um, okay, okay, okay. It, it requires an invite. Um, if I still have my Bruno at uh email address, um, it would be better to send me because I, I, I need to send invites uh, individually. My, my Slack group is not public. You need an invite, so I will send an invite to whoever's interested. It, it's free. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm not making money on that. Although I'm thinking of creating a Patreon Patreon account because it's still pretty much time consuming. So I wouldn't mind getting uh, ten or fifteen dollars per month for each uh, participant. But I mean, at the moment, there's nothing, so it's free. So uh, again, if my uh, email address is still valid, send me an email address. Uh, send me a mail, and I will send an invite. Yeah, I'll make sure that that um, um, alias works. Otherwise, I can give you a, okay, I'll give a chat group. Chat, chat, chat. Okay, uh, I've got a generic if you at sfr.info. That should work. That, also, that's, that should also work. Oh, it's all panelists. Oh, no, I want to send to everyone. 
Oh, so that email address, that SFR, that FR? Well, it's it's short and sweet. I mean, I've got longer email addresses, but like I like this one. That's a good one. Than that. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so that's that's one question. I know I may I may have lost quite a few people. Um, I'm sorry about that. I, you know, there's a lot to talk about in uh, just an hour. Um, but I can I can recommend everyone who has who have who has not seen um, the previous presentations in the last two years. Um, the, the principles haven't changed really. So there, there's been a, some adaptation to the market, but still same stuff. So, and maybe you need experience, some skills, and of course, to know your stuff. I, again, I, I am a big fan of learning the Greeks. I've mentioned Vanna today. I know for many traders, Vanna doesn't mean a thing. So yeah, it's important to know Greeks. But I, I can answer questions um, on, on the Slack group with pleasure. Okay, I just added that to the uh, a link to your email so people can request that. Um, I sent you a link to uh, the presentation. It's a PDF. Yep. yep, I've got that linked as well. Okay. So have I lost everyone or are there still a few more questions? Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, Everybody's pretty much still here, so I guess they absorbed what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I know. Uh, coming from a quant background, I know. Uh, I mean, some people believe I overcomplicate things. No, I don't. I mean, think it's still a very simple thing. It's 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 common sense and experience, and I'm very happy to share experience with. I mean, but I only do it on my Slack group at the moment. I really have very little free time. I mentioned that I've, I've, I've done a Koch study and I'm working on an automated volatility strategy. Um, I do a lot of things. I do a lot of things. And I'm coding my, something I showed before, Gates and Vex, to try and figure out what dealers are doing on the other side of the market. Yeah, so that's for any question, Contact me on Slack and I will explain. I can share some code as well. So, okay. Um, Kieran asked, uh, when exactly do you hedge for Vega by adding a calendar? And what are you looking at? The Delta Vega number, the underlying? Oh, I, the thing is, I can't really hear you. I hear myself. You can't hear me? Well, can I you see the chat? The sound is very muted. Oh, can you hear the chat or see read the chat? I can read the chat, yeah. Okay. Is the question on chat? Yes. What are you looking at? Delta, Vega number and the line. Uh, to hedge for Vega, yeah, I, I use a calendar. When, uh, when I feel the market is about to collapse or something, and I feel I've got too much Vega exposure or Let's say I just want a holiday. I don't want to look at the spring for 24 hours or 48 hours. Then I will hedge my Delta and my Vega. Um, I, I generally use calendars. Um, in high vol, calendars do well. Backwardation, also a good time for calendars. Um, but you can also hedge your Vega by buying a PDS. But some people feel that uh, um, having more directional adjustments can be can can backfire on you. I can understand that. So I would say my Vega hedging is mostly with calendars on both sides. What are you looking at? Delta, Vega, and the line. Uh, um, no, I, I, my T plus zero is my key thing. You know, I want my my T plus zero to be <clears throat> good looking. Um, for example, today I checked <clears throat> volatility over a month. And I, I knew that we have a one SD is 70 points today. So we, we hit, I think, 43.50 earlier. Now we were down to 42.80. This is normal market behavior. So it's only one sigma, one SD, and nothing, nothing major. Um, so it can be, of course, traumatic for some people. But so what, what I want really is to cover my one SD on both ways. Um, and sometimes if I feel that my, my Vega is going to, a little bit too risky, I will hedge. I mean, if you place your, I place my, my I mean, as I just said, for example, for, for April, 
my calendar is on 3900. So it, it's not a big kick to my, my position. I'm still vega negative, but I am definitely less vega negative than I would be if I didn't have it. So it's, it's mitigating. And sometimes, as I said, sometimes if I want really to disconnect, switch off, I will, I will hedge my vega completely. That has happened, but a hedge is often a cost. If you really want to hedge fully, I mean, a hedge is always dynamic. A uh, hedge, I mean, you can't control everything at, on, on, I mean, for, for any underlying and all the time. It, it's, a, it's very much dynamic. But I, I'm trying to hedge at least to be comfortable, at least for sometimes 24 hours. For example, if um, I'm not, okay, tomorrow we've got GDP and the market will move again. Um, but to me, that's not as important as, for example, the tension in Ukraine. If I feel that something big can happen, yes, I will hedge. And sometimes the volatility then deflates completely. It's going to be a waste of a hedge. Yeah. So do you take off a hedge? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, there, there's a hedge that I keep peace of mind of a week, two weeks. For example, I put on my, my 3900 put calendar. I may actually have had another one soon, I don't know. Uh, not that, I mean, this, this trend is, is looking good. It's already a profit target. So yeah, I may, I may have a, 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 another hedge just for the sake of protecting my profit. That's quite possible. So there are different motivations for a hedge. But generally, if it's just for, for to protect for an event and it, it's the, the risk is gone. Yeah, then I'll, I'll take off my hedge. Yeah. So you yeah, mentioned you were, Yeah, sorry. Oh, you said you mentioned you're at their profit target. Uh, do you, when do you close down a trade? Well, to be honest, uh, this roller coaster of a market, I'm down 1% uh, year to date. So I, I, I'd like to get a, a, another 1% or 2% on this trade. So, but generally, if I get to about $1,000, I'm happy. $800, I'm happy. Let's not forget that I am leveraged. So this 2% rate T, uh, 900 is about 2.5%. Uh, on my account, it's probably close to 4%. So yeah, I could, I could, I could take it off. But I think there's more... Mm, it, more it's, money it's to be a made. Little bit, a little bit more. All right, Bruno, I think that's it for the questions. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming on. Uh, we're right at an hour, so good time to stop. Uh, yeah. Hope things are going well for you. And uh, yeah, again, thanks. And uh, I'll, uh, thank you, and I've got the, uh, the links in the uh, recording for the, uh, the Slack group, so I'm sure you'll get some requests for that. So okay, cool. uh, thanks very much, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, um, thank you. maybe we'll have you on again in the future. Come to the Slack group and I'll be happy to answer questions. Great. We'll be in touch, okay. Bruno, and uh, yeah, Thank we'll get you. together one of these days. Yes, I hope so too. I mean, I know that you went to Belgium a little earlier than planned, but we'll, we'll come to Barcelona. I mean, as simple as that. Yeah, and you're always welcome in Colorado Springs. So. I will definitely. All right. Well, thanks Thank everyone for sticking with us, and uh, Bruno, we'll see you later. Thank you. Bye bye. All right.